Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast. And today we have on Guy Spear, uh, who runs and manages the portfolio at uh, Aquamarine Fund. Uh, Guy, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be with you, Eric. It's, Thank you so much for teaching you me. <laughs> oh, to, to, to teach you how to use the mic? Oh, that, that, that was a great place to start. You know, that was I've got great. so much that was to fun. learn. Yeah, before we started, we were adjusting the mic and we have the, we have the same microphone, so... You know, we, we're we're Mike twins. So uh, I'm impressed with Eric because he actually started a podcast, and I've been thinking about it for a long time, but haven't been able to find the time and the resources and the ability to use a mic in order to get one going. But uh, Eric, the reason why I have the same mic as you is this: about three years ago, I thought this was something that I wanted to do, so I went and bought the mic. Right. right. <laughs> the mic was the least of my issues. So, so either you have to actually just commit and carve out the time or be honest that you don't want to do it and delegate it to someone else or just don't do it at all. Yeah, that's see, exactly see, it's, right. It's one or the other, right? But it's a, it's a very, very special medium. And I try to make as much time as I can for this medium because I, it was, I think, Marshall McLuhan who said that uh, radio is a warm, is a hot medium. Television is a cold medium. And there's just something very personal about doing uh, radio or yeah. podcasting. And that, by the way, so uh, I think that I've, I've not appeared on live radio very many times, but going into a real radio studio mm -hmm. is also really, really special. They're kind of small, intimate spaces. And the same thing that you did with me with the microphone, it becomes intimate in a way that television just isn't. And the phone conversation isn't either. That's true. That's true. I, I actually did college radio back in the day. And I, I loved it for the personal, probably for the same reason I like podcasting. It, there, yeah. there is that personal touch to it that you wouldn't get um, on, on TV. And, the, yeah, there's a way that you reveal yourself. And it's so strange because most, I mean, we're looking at each other. Yeah. But most of the people listening to this, maybe everyone, will only hear us. But it's just so intimate. There's so much more of you that's revealed. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah, and, and for the listeners, we um, have now started putting some episodes on YouTube, which is part of the reason now I'm doing the video. So if you don't want to listen in your car and you actually want to see the interaction, it'll also be on YouTube now. But, you know, I just figured out how to uh, fuzz out my background. So it's, you, it's the, really cool. <laughs> the viewers won't be able to see the great... Uh, photograph that i have of warren buffett on the wall behind me unless i well but i can take a photograph of you of that for you and you can take a look at it so if you want to take a photograph i can put it in the show notes that'll be fine <laughs> actually maybe maybe i'll introduce you to the friend who took the photograph and uh oh, then cool. uh, you could interview her actually she's her name is jillian seagal and uh, she wrote a book that is bright orange in its cover and it's called getting there okay and one of the people she interviewed was Warren Buffett and in each part with each person she took a photograph and interviewed them another person that she interviewed was Michael Bloomberg oh interesting which is interesting given yeah. that he might well be the Democratic Party nominee for the presidency it's, it's and very possible. Uh, yeah it's a, she's a great person to interview and um, has a lot of wisdom about life but uh, um, so yeah so yeah yeah, go ahead. Yeah, tell, right. just tell us a little bit more about you for those who aren't familiar with who you are. You know, how, how long have you been running Aquamarine? Had had you get started? Just give us a little general overview. Of yeah, who who is Guy Spear? You know, Eric, I'm I'm proud to be able to tell you, and I was saying this to somebody earlier today, that I've been running the Aquamarine Fund for more than twenty years. I believe that this year is the twenty second year of operation, and. You know, uh, just longevity in the investing world. There are so many people who leave uh, the uh, work of investing for one reason or another. Uh, they either leave because they made a mistake in the portfolio and they, quote, blew up, either because they owned the wrong stocks or 
they went short the wrong stocks or they used leverage or uh, they lost their investors for one reason or another. And investing is a game where if you can just keep at it for long enough, good things start to happen. So, you know, in a certain way, when I was running the fund for five, seven, eight years, 13 years, my resume was my returns. I almost feel like now I can say my resume is the fact that I'm still in business, um, you know, 22 years into it. So I run the Aquamarine Fund. It started with friends and family money. It's still really, uh, it was friends, family plus, uh, and uh, we have about 150 investors. We have about a quarter of a billion dollars invested in publicly traded equities, uh, not just in the U.S. markets, but in other markets like India. Uh, and uh, various markets in Europe. I try to keep a concentrated portfolio. It's uh, If it works well, it's an extraordinary living, an extraordinary life. I would say that one of the things I've learned recently is that the people, not everybody who invests in the fund is my friend when they invest, but I certainly work hard to turn them into friends and to turn them into colleagues and collaborators over the course of uh, their investing with me. And Increasingly, I've found that some of the investors who join me have become I, actually the funny thing is, is that uh, there's one investor I'm thinking of who might, through the conversations with me, go out and launch his own investment partnership because this person is just extraordinarily smart and um, uh, has learned a lot, I would like to claim, through me, but also has the capacity to do it uh, on their own. And so uh, that's kind of fun. And uh, building that Karetsu around me is an enormous amount of fun. So that's me. And yeah, then cool. I, you go ahead. So the other thing that uh, I guess I have to add is that five years ago I wrote a book, uh, which is kind of a mid-career memoir is what I would call it, which is a little bit of here's what I got right, here's what I got wrong, here are some of the mistakes that I made, here are some good resources for you, the reader, uh, here are some ideas that I have. And uh, a big selling point for the book with the publisher was that a few years prior, I'd had, I'd bid on and won a, um, a lunch with Warren Buffett, uh, which uh, still probably is the thing that I'm most associated with, with my friend Monish Pabrai. And so 10 years ago, there's a chapter in the book where I describe in lurid detail uh, what it was like to have lunch with Warren Buffett, almost down to the detail of with which hand he picked up his Diet Coke and how big his cuts not quite that much detail but pretty close well, and, what, what, um, what was what was that like it was awesome <laughs> next question <laughs> but just we, we'll get into that but before we get okay. there uh for the reader or the listener uh, i was living in new york until about 10 years ago and i woke up one morning three children born in new york city columbia presbyterian hospital in case you're interested best hospital on the planet so my, my, one of the my best. dad used to be um the vice chairman of pediatrics there well thank him from me it was never fun when every now and then we had to walk uh we went through i don't remember why the neonatal unit which is one of the best in the region if not the country and that was very hard to see but i woke up one day and felt like i no longer wanted to live in new york city hmm. and forgive me all you americans out there but if I wasn't going to live in New York City, I wasn't sure I wanted to live in the United States. Yep. Actually, we would have been fine. We had thoughts about moving to Park Slope, Palo Alto, Boston. We just wanted a better environment for our children, but ended up picking Zurich. So I've been living in Zurich now for the last 10 years. And uh, with 10 years residence, I now actually qualify for Swiss citizenship. So we've just initiated that application. We'll see how that goes. Congratulations. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean I'll get it. But <laughs> okay. Are they pretty picky? <laughs> so, um, they, they, there are so many things, Eric, that, the United, that, that Switzerland, there's, there, there's an enormous number of things that the United States gets right. Mm -hmm. Let's just be clear about that. Uh, and there are many things that the United States gets more right than any other country on the planet. And I love uh, the United States and I'm proud to be associated with it and will always consider myself a New Yorker, even though I don't live there. But there are some things that Switzerland gets right, which make it an, a truly an extraordinary place. And like uh, what, what, would, what would you say they get really right? Um, uh, there's a very, very strong social contract here. There's an enormous amount of trust uh, amongst the people that the system is set up for all of us. 
uh, in the best possible way. I don't know of any country, probably perhaps the Scandinavian countries, where that sense of trust in the state exists. And um, I don't know of any place that I've been to where people really feel like the state is us. You know, when you look at the founding words of the Constitution of the United States, the first words are, we the people. Mm -hmm. We the people form this uh, commonwealth for us, for life, liberty, and happiness. But, you know, when we pay our taxes, when I lived in the United States and paid my taxes, did I really, really feel like I was paying it for us? That's the theory. But there's this feeling that a lot of the money is being wasted. A lot of the money is going on programs that really the only reason why they're there is because some narrow interest group has managed to find a way to finagle it through the government that it sticks there. And I know of a guy who lives in another town in Switzerland where he's a dual taxpayer, so he he pays he files a US tax return and a Swiss tax return. And he's constantly trying to maximize to increase the amount of taxes that he pays in Switzerland and re- uh, because, why? Because he he knows that that money is going to stuff that he gets a benefit from. So uh, the state is extraordinarily frugal. The public finances are good. Uh, the money is spent on things that actually benefit across the population. So the money is not just spent on programs that you know the taxpayer doesn't see. For example, I live in a place where there's beautiful parks that are maintained. If you know, right next door to me, I'm I'm in a beautiful office building. I feel very lucky to be in it. But right next door is the schoolhouse for the district. And this is prime property. And uh, in other towns and cities around the world, the municipality might think of selling off that property. They could get a lot of money for it. But that that building will always be a schoolhouse. And it's a schoolhouse in a prime location. And that is perfectly normal for Switzerland. So Interesting. just so many things that, and just back to your question of uh, citizenship, um, you know, they, they don't automatically grant citizenship and it's not just about a background check. Yeah. Have you committed any crimes? There are all sorts of reasons why they could decide not to grant citizenship, which is kind of the way it should be. Perhaps right. a good way, I mean, to help you to, th- to sort of understand all the benefits of uh, living in Switzerland. So, Eric, um, Switzerland doesn't have personal capital gains tax. Okay. So, uh, you know, the money you make is yours. They're not going to they're not, not going to tax you twice. So, if you know, if you have a tax on income and then you have a, a then you get taxed a second time, no. Once the money's come to you, the only way you get taxed a second time is is on wealth. So, okay. there is a wealth tax. Uh, but you can really, in many ways you can think of living in Switzerland, becoming a citizen of Switzerland as being a bit like joining a very nice country club. And once you become a member, and there are, quote, membership dues, if you like, there are all these benefits that arise. And even down to the police force, uh, when you're here in Zurich, you rarely see the police. And somebody who's an expert in these things explained to me that the Swiss police force operate more like a private security force. So they don't have a system of the beat. You don't see policemen just patrolling the streets in one way or another but Mm -hmm. if you pick up the phone and call the station you'll get a real voice on the other end and they'll come out very quickly if you need their help with something and uh, but the way they come out is very interesting first of all the that person will take your name they'll take your phone number they'll probably do a look up to know where you live uh, so they know that it's kind of a citizen or a member of the community that's putting that call in and then they will come out to address whatever issue you have. But there's, they're coming out to address the concern of a citizen vis-a-vis possibly another citizen. And then they go back. I mean, they're busy. Yeah. So, and I could, I could sort of go on and on. But um, it's an extraordinarily well-run place, perhaps one of the best-run places on the planet. It's in- that's uh, interesting. It feels like it's one of those things where without being there, it's, it's, it's hard to fully gauge what that's like. Is that would you say that's correct? Oh, absolutely. You, you wouldn't feel it very much by observing Switzerland from afar. But all you need to do is do transit in Zurich Airport. Yeah, uh, you've never seen an airport that's so clean and so efficient. Huh. I would argue not even the best airports in Europe. I mean, uh, no airport in Germany. And Germany is a pretty clean and efficient place. Runs as efficiently as as the airports in Zurich. And 
it's a national value for things to function well and reliably. And so uh, they do. And when you experience it, it's just a, it's a kind of a heaven, really. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I've told people, and I believe that it's true, I would not have written my book, or if I had written it, it would not have been as successful had I not been living in Zurich or in Switzerland. And there are some really interesting people who did some really valuable work here in Zurich. So Albert Einstein, well, he was in Bern. But also in Zurich, he was a lot of the work that he did on relativity was done here in Switzerland when he was working for the patent office. Um, Richard Wagner, you may or may not be a fan, did some music writing here. James Joyce lived in Zurich for a while. Really? And so there are some really uh, some extraordinary personalities who've spent time here. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was here uh, writing a book. I don't remember which book it was. It's not the book that he's most famous for. But uh, then, um, what do you, what do you the, think it is about um, being there that you you know you said the book wouldn't have been as successful if you had done it somewhere yeah. else? What, what do you what do you think's behind that? So so there are people who would say that Switzerland is a boring place, and when they say why do you want to live in Zurich? Isn't Zurich boring? And my answer is actually boring is good. So what you have in Zurich is that. All the daily frictions of life, how do you get to and from work, how do you uh, do a whole bunch of stuff, just disappears into the background. And you can focus on the really important stuff like, am I happy? Uh, you know, What should my life be about? Uh, what's the novel I'm going to write? What's the book I'm going to write? So I think that people are not aware, especially if you live in a big city in the US or in the rest of Europe, uh, of how much that friction gets in the way of dealing with the things that are really important in life well, rather than... I mean, just, I'll just give you one example. Yeah. Well, no, I, just, I, just, example. I just want to ask, ask you one thing, though. The, I mean, there's lots of small towns in the United States, but I don't, there seems to be something that you feel is very special about Zurich that's more than just it's a quiet place. Yeah, I, I actually... Uh, you know, those I once visited... I can't remember. I was vis doing a company visit, actually. I was visiting Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, yep. And it was a lovely, lovely small town with a theater and a nice downtown district. I, I like the downtown of Grand Rapids. Yeah, it was really lovely. Uh, the difference between... And, and I think that many towns in the Midwest are um, kind of similar to Zurich in that way, except that Zurich has a worldwide airport. So you have a... Uh, not quite JFK, but not that far off JFK. For me, to the airport is a 15-minute train ride. It takes me right into the terminal. And, you know, if I want to go home, it's a seven-minute tram ride with a tram ticket. And it, it, the city, unlike Grand Rapids, has an international airport. It has an opera house. It has the headquarters of two major world banks. It has all this infrastructure for a tiny, tiny place. But I think, yeah... A, a, other huh. than the extraordinary infrastructure that Zurich has as a global city, m much of what I'm describing you could also get in a city like or in a town like Grand Rapids. But you know, but you get this global feel to it that that you really wouldn't get in a in a small town in the United States. You know, I I, I don't know if it's public knowledge. So I, I the the head of a major news organization. Mm -hmm that is producing news globally decided to put his headquarters here because, you know, this, this person that I had lunch with today uh, had lived in, in the same news organization, which is one that you will have certainly heard of. Um, uh, he, you know, spent time in New York city, real difficulty dealing with Asia uh, was in Paris, difficulty getting in and out of the city, decided to base himself in Zurich. Uh, you know, it's the headquarters of, Credit Suisse and UBS, that's, you know, it's the headquarters of Swiss reinsurance. It's the headquarters of partner reinsurance. Uh, you don't get that in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So uh, you've got so many benefits of a large city with none of the frictions of a large city. I mean, when it, so when I get on and off the tram, I don't have to show a ticket. I don't have to buy a ticket. I have a an annual subscription. It's a small thing. Mm -hmm. The annual subscription is $800. And almost everybody has one. And I get on and off the tram without having to 
the tram is set up in such a way that it never gets into a traffic jam, even if there were a traffic jam, because it has its own set of traffic lights and every major junction it has priority. So the lights allow the tram to get through. And so even through the congested parts of town, you can reliably get from one side of town to the other in a very short period of time because the trams work. And all of that removal of the friction of day-to-day life means that um, you can focus on the things that are important. And that, by the way, goes way beyond basic infrastructural things. So um, I'll just give you an example of something that's quite normal. Sure. Based on a verbal understanding, I was looking at a, a real estate for my office not long after I'd arrived. And uh, I wanted to go away and think about it. And the agent who was showing me this very nice real estate space said, look, that's fine, but I go on holiday tomorrow. Uh, so what do you want to do? And I said, well, presumably you have a partner. And he said, he thought about it. He said, you know what? Um, I'll just hold this for you until I come back. It was two weeks. He was on holiday for two weeks. And uh, I was, you know, New York City, that would be like, hey, you snooze, you lose. All right. Here's my partner, best of luck. And if somebody comes and offers a higher price, such is life. And he just said, no, I'm holding this for you within a day or two of me coming back. Just let me know if you want it. If you want it, that's great. And if you don't, at that point, I'll look around and see who else is in line. And then I happened to ask him, by the way, where are you going on holiday? And he said, oh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to be home. So this is... This yeah. is a place where if you form, if you have an understanding with somebody, it's a very, very high likelihood that understanding will be respected by both sides. It's also a place where if you decide to leave and go on holiday, you're, you're on vacation for a week. You're genuinely on vacation. Yeah. And so it's a place that allows you to structure and organize your life with calmness and quietness and go about the task of thinking and doing the things thinking about and doing the things that are really important like raising a family being a great dad to your kids you know, staying fit and healthy uh, uh thousands of different things and uh it's strange because i don't think that people talk about places like switzerland being very productive it's not because people work harder it's because switzerland is set up in such a way that you don't have to work harder in order to be more productive that's that's yeah. fascinating. I'm I was laughing before more in awe. You know when you like you hear something kind of shock, you're like, hmm, like kind of <laughs> like that. Um, that's fascinating. You know, I mean, I, yeah. So I, I'll go on just a little Please. bit more. So um, you know, the, this uh, Value X uh, conference that I hold in Clusters is on the way to Davos. So if you drive another 15 minutes or so, you're in Davos, which is where the World Economic Forum takes place. And mm -hmm. in the 10 years that we've been living here, the drive up to Klosters has been reduced by about 20 minutes because they've built two new tunnels through the mountains. And in the time that I've lived here, the time to take a train to Milan has been reduced. Zurich to Milan is now two hours and 30 minutes. It used to be two hours and 50 minutes. Why? Because they dug out an enormous train tunnel, a very long train tunnel, one of the deepest train tunnels in the world, I understand, through the Alps. So this is a country where they're constantly investing in improving the infrastructure, improving the quality of life, improving the conditions for business. It's just great to live in a place that does that. Yeah, know? yeah, that's really so, cool. Well, you know, one, one thing I admire about you is that you have a real commitment to your own self-awareness, to being aware of other people. Um, you know, like there's that uh, quote, the unexamined life is a life not worth living. And you're someone who's really taken on really examining uh, life and what it has to offer and human potential. And I, and it always seemed interesting, you know, you've, you share somewhat, not a whole lot, but somewhat that, you know, you've done some work with Tony Robbins and, and maybe there's other stuff you've done. Could you share a little bit about some of those experiences and yeah. maybe even share some things that, you know, weren't in your book or that, you know, you don't really have much of an opportunity to talk about. I, we, I'd love to, I'd love to hear more uh, about that. Well, and you know what, what the book is really about, I would argue is about helping the reader to understand that, um, you know, I was starting to get a little bit of success and people started attributing that success to things like my education. And I'm not saying that I'm not grateful for my education. I am. Uh, but there's a chapter in my book called The Perils of an Elite Education. Yeah. And um, I feel like 
what happened to me is that I had, and the book starts with this, I had a, a, a major career failure, major, major career failure within a couple of years of coming out of business school. And this was, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I can't say of epic proportions because what what does epic mean? And, you know, one of the things that I just love and value about the United States is its ability to uh, allow people to fail and then move on. But I'd gone to work, I'd exercised very bad judgment in hindsight, and I'd gone to work for a, a place that was ultimately shot down for securities violations. And um, that did not show great uh, moral insight or judgment or character on my part. And as I described myself, I was just a guy who was looking to get rich quick, if you like. I was a right. Gordon Gecko wannabe. And... Um, but I got to a place pretty quick after business school where everything I'd learned at university and business school was not going to help me. And I was thrown against myself. I was thrown back onto my back feet. And I was getting there in a certain way way too late in life because you want to make those mistakes as young as possible because that's where you have the most opportunity to recover, both in terms of the time you have left in your career but also in terms of the adaptability of your mind and the willingness to make major changes. And um, without having, you know, my education wasn't going to help me. And I certainly thought about going back and studying some more. Uh, so I started reaching around. It didn't hurt that I had a Barnes & Noble just at the end of my street. So I had a, an apartment on West 67th Street and down there in Lincoln Lincoln Square just near to uh, the Metropolitan Opera, there was a Barnes & Noble that is now a Century 21. I really miss that it's gone, but they had a really good self-help section. So I was pulling all sorts of books off that self-help section. And around the same time, through a conversation with friends, I became interested in psychotherapy, which I think is very much in the air in New York City. And so I ended up with a Jungian psychotherapist and uh, I also had a very, very good friend who was a fan of somebody called Diana Fosho, who was a, um, uh, she has a, a name for the kind of therapy that she does, but it was different to Jungian therapy. So I was like looking for any way to help me to self-improve uh -huh. or to, or not even self-improve, but I was like, I had gotten to a point where I understood that getting more education was not what was going to get me out of the kind of career mess that I was in. And just to describe the career mess briefly um i'd gone to work for a guy who had offered me riches in fact i believe he said i can make you rich young man something like that mm -hmm. and it turned out that the way that i was supposed to do that was to uh, push the boundaries of what was ethical and legal at this brokerage firm and in my book i describe it as being not dissimilar to uh wolf of wall street um and, uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, we weren't quite taking shoe stores public and selling them to widows and orphans, but not far off. There were also some very sharp practices that we were engaging in vis-a-vis -vis companies that were raising capital through us. And so in terms of, you know, I figured out it took me way too long, but it took me 18 months to get out of that and to say, this is not for me. I don't care if I don't do another deal again. I'm never going to do this again. But then people looked at me and they just said, well, either this guy is a crook or he's too dumb to realize that he was working for crooks. Either way, we don't want to have anything to do with him. So I'd, you know, that's pretty thorough blotting of your copybook, if you like. And um, where was I to go from there? All of those beautiful credentials that I had, Oxford University, Harvard Business School, were not helping me anymore because right. people came to that conclusion. And... Um, so then I, I needed something else to help me, and that's when I started looking at all these other alternatives, if you like. And I went through a period mm -hmm. probably of a couple of years where I was, you know, quite depressed. Uh, not clinically depressed, but, you know, I didn't want to go out much. I spent a lot of time reading. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the Manhattan Chess Club playing chess, uh, but not really engaging with the world professionally or socially, actually. And um, and so that's the context in which I discovered you brought up Tony Robbins. But mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I, I, I said it in the book and I believe it today. Uh, human beings are infinite in their variety. 
human mind is an extraordinary thing. It's infinite in its variety. And therefore, there are an infinite number of therapies and coaches and uh, forms of transformational help that one can get. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, what I told my readers and I hold to it today is, you know, use your instincts, go find what works for you. If it's working for you, keep doing it. If it's not working, stop doing it and find something else. And, um, and so, part, you know, if we talk about those tools, uh, the tools that really helped me, I think, to figure out how to make a success of my life, uh, I found in well-known works, but they really are wonderful. I mean, uh, we have Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. We have um, uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, we have the whole uh, realm of positive psychology. Uh, then we have the whole realm of, but those are really important books. Anthony Robbins would fit in there somewhere. Uh, and then we have um, the whole realm of, you know, the various different kinds of psychotherapy that mm -hmm. one can do. And I think all of those are extraordinary. Uh, actually, I think that I made a lot of progress on myself through writing the book. That's one of the most difficult things that I've done. And only recently did I start to understand that I should have uh, a kind of a meditation practice, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so I've started using that. And funnily enough, I had the opportunity to go and have lunch with a famous investor amongst some circles, a guy called Arnold Fundenberg, who's a Holocaust survivor and didn't graduate high school. And he runs around $2 billion, I believe, out of Austin, Texas. And, um, you know, he's, he's a guy who's big into yoga. Mm -hmm. He's big into meditation. Uh, he's big into self-hypnosis, uh, visualization. And so that's just a whole panoply of stuff. And I think that, uh, you know, we have to we have to use that in a way that keeps us grounded. I think that many people who use those different techniques, they kind of fly off into outer space and they're not really part of the real world. Yeah. Which I don't think is the point of those techniques. Those nope. techniques are tools for life that to help us to be present and live in life. And I would add to those, by the way, all of the major religions. I mean, the you know, all of those religions, what they're really getting at is these kind of deep psychological truths. And if that's your path to, to enlightenment, if you like, then that's also great. But the point for the book is to help the reader to understand that it's not actually a great education that, that really helped me. It's all these other tools that I learned in a certain way far too late in life. Well, and what were a few things um, that, you know, you personally, um, either out of meditation or out of doing some, you know, coaching with Tony Robbins, things that you personally got out of those practices for yourself? I mean, I'll, I'll just give one that comes yeah, to sure. mind is um, Tony Robbins talks quite a bit about new neuro linguistic programming. <clears throat> and for, for our is, listeners who don't know what that is, can you? Exactly. Yeah. It's just a fancy phrase for something quite simple, which is that our minds are deeply impacted by the words that we use. And, you know, simply choosing to use a different word to describe something to somebody else or ourselves is actually a shift in our psychology. And before I go to words, they've done this amazing experiment. I want to kind of show it to you. Sure. And this is... Uh, so this will be for the viewers. But what I'm doing is I'm putting a pen uh, into my mouth so I don't, for a second. Okay. So a pen is in so the spirit's mouth right now. It was in my mouth. Okay. And um, so that forces, if you, if you have a pen across your teeth, yeah. it forces a slight smile, but a, um, a uh, forced smile. And we can all force okay. ourselves to smile. There is wiring in our brain. We think we're happy, therefore we smile. Mm -hmm. It turns out that you can make a very strong argument that we smile and then our brains decide that we're happy. So many of the loops don't work the way we think that they work. And just another experiment that's been done is, and I, I have just read about the experiment. I haven't read the experiment itself, but um, they wire up the person's head in such a way that they can use the pattern of the brainwaves to to make predictions about what 
uh, the person is about to say. Mm -hmm. And so they'll ask them a question, a service, a, a, a question like that we're going to show you a screen and there's going to be a blue circle and a red circle. Just choose one of them, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the brain waves that they read, they can predict with a very high degree of accuracy. Oh, so they, they ask the subject, pick red or blue and tell us the moment when you've picked red or blue. So, you know, it's like you see the screen and say, I pick red or I pick blue. Right. Uh, but they can predict that which one the person will, will, will choose up to seven seconds before the person's actually consciously aware that they've made a choice. So this is all, all shows that there are feedback loops that go in the opposite direction that we think. And so this idea that forcing a smile can actually change our mood is very much the case. And so if you know that, then what you really want to do is start training, for example, your use of language. Yep. So uh, it's a big difference to say, I can't stand it in here. I wish these people would go away to, I can't wait till we decide to leave. Is a very is basically expressing the same sentiment. I don't want to be here, but it's expressing it in a very different way. Uh, or um, rather than saying I feel so sick, I've got this massive headache. To say I can't wait till the headache is no longer with me. How do and you so, how do you distinguish that from? Because on on the surface, say for someone who, with no experience in any of this, no background in any of this, I'm I'm a little. I don't know if I'm the best person to ask you this because I'm I'm so entrenched in this conversation that there might yeah. be certain biases that are coming out right now. But how would you <coughs> excuse me? How would you distinguish that from something, say, like positive thinking, where on the surface, you know, you feel a certain way, and then you decide I'm gonna, I'm going to go lie to myself and just be really positive to cover up whatever I don't like, and then I get more miserable. What's how how do you or I don't know about how, but how do you? How would you distinguish what you're talking about versus lying and covering up and creating more yeah. misery versus an authentic experience of something completely? You know, it's a shift in experience. How do you, how do you distinguish it's, that? It's a great question, and I can tell you that um, this is really going back uh, about sixteen, maybe fifteen years. So we, I and my wife were newly married, and. Um, she was trying to figure out whether she wanted to go back to work or not. And she'd found a course in the Berkshires, uh, which was going to help us to do that. So we signed up for a kind of some kind of retreat in a sort of like a retreat center. And, and there were some people walking, we left after about six hours and there were some people walking around with this like happy story saying, I'm so happy. Right. And I was like, and it just, maybe they were maybe they're on drugs i have no idea but they didn't feel as you said authentic and yeah. realistic and so um uh it, the the idea is and i and we don't have a concrete example to use the idea is not to sort of like slather some paint over you know, i guess the, the famous expression of are not trying to put lipstick on a pig i, I say whipped cream on shit is still shit yes exactly so yeah. we are trying to you know, you know, you are not trying to say, I don't have a headache. I don't have a headache. Right. It's, it's, it's engaging with that pain and saying, wow, my head is pounding so bad. I'm going to be so grateful when this is gone or something that happens to me, God forbid, I get flu this winter. But when there's flu, you know, there's that, there's that moment that you, the day that you wake up and you know that your body's beaten the, beaten the cold and there's mm -hmm. a kind of a release and a kind of a relaxation and there's yeah. a kind of a relief. And, uh, and, you know, to say to myself, I know, I know that that day is going to come, or I know that maybe just tonight, and if not night, tomorrow night. And um, uh, I, I don't know, you, you're absolutely right. That it, I, I guess it's not so much how do you do it as to be aware that the technique, mm -hmm. it is effectively a thinking technique, is not to cover over but to engage with reality but to see reality in a different light and to yeah. give a different association to it be, be, um, be essentially being able to be with the experience and re really be with the experience yeah to be with your experience but to associate it to something um so uh look so so here's another habit of mind that is i guess i learned this an awfully long time ago and i probably don't put into practice because I haven't felt really bad about things for a long time, but 
uh, I found when I was living alone in New York City that uh, I would get home to my apartment sometimes after a vacation or visiting my family, and I'd feel kind of down and depressed because I was all alone. Mm -hmm. And I learned that um, if I tried to reach out and help somebody, anybody, it helped me to forget my loneliness and forget helped me to forget my sadness. And so uh, I needed to use the feeling of loneliness and unhappiness as, as a trigger to figure out who I can go help. Right. And um, and that, again, is a kind of a way, and Anthony Robbins describes this better than anyone I know. He kind of says, look, there's machinery in your mind. There's voices in your mind. There's a self-narrative that is going on that right now you don't control. Yeah, you, you have about 60,000 thoughts a day that are completely out of your control. Well, what he kind of says is, no, we're going to help you to to – uh, decide what state you want to be in and we're right. going to get you there and we're going to show you the tools and what Anton Robbins kind of says is this is not rocket science this is doesn't have to be random you know one of the first lectures that I remember hearing and he probably uses it in his UPW Unleash the Power Week, Within Weekend is how emotion is related to motion mm -hmm. and that you know and I guess the simple, the what, simple what, idea what is, is what do you mean by that so, you know, it's hard to be unhappy if you're dancing. Got it. It's, you know, you're feeling down, get up and go for a walk, you know? And and so the realization, and, and I went through a short period in my life, about three months, where I was probably close to clinical depression. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, And the scary thing was that, you know, all the things that would normally lift my mood did not lift my mood. But I knew, because I'd read and done things like Anthony Robbins, I knew that I had to just keep stimulating my system. So I made myself go out for walks every day. And yeah. that shows that I wasn't completely clinically depressed, because somebody who's clinically depressed, even if they're self-aware, may not even be able to do that. Right. Uh, but I knew that I had to mobilize that machinery. And, uh, and understanding that machinery, whether it's neurolinguistic programming or associative conditioning, it's just extraordinarily powerful if you can get into it. And not just uh, letting your mind kind of run on automatic survival, essentially. Yeah, I'll give you another example. Sure. And this is, this is. Uh, I mean, I guess I do apply it in all sorts of ways. I mean, I, this is from a workout. Well, that's that's like why it. I'm asking, because I know for me, for instance, you know, I did a lot of um, work with another um, training and development company. And it's become so much of a predominant baseline in my life. Sometimes I... I I stop being present to how much it's actually impacting me on my day-to-day -day living. And then someone will say, well, what did you get out of that? And I'll start sharing. And to them, it's like, whoa. And then I start getting present to, wow, I, it hasn't always been like this for me. <laughs> and right. it, it really represents me to possibilities and to things I've created and to just things that sometimes I'll take for granted if I go a little unconscious. So Congratulations. It is, it is kind of, thank, that's, thank you. that's really fun and inspiring and um, you know, the funny thing is, is that we have my wife, but my wife has done a number of Anthony Robbins seminars and we every now and then want to just like go and buy a group's booking and go and send 30 of our friends or 30 people in our lives who we yeah. feel like would make a difference for. But I'll just give you one example. Please. And then, you know, so, um, I was, this is not a guy who's has spent any time around Anthony Robbins, but it's a guy who's done Navy SEAL training. Okay. Yep. And he explained to me, you know, we've all been there. We're out on our running workout and it starts to rain. And what he said to me is he said, what you got to do, of course, it's like, oh, God, the, the initial bodily reaction is, oh, it's raining. This is so awful. Maybe yeah. I don't want to run. Maybe I'll shorten my run. Maybe I'll go home. He said, no, what you do is you, you try and get in there before that natural reaction comes and say, yes, rain. You know, by the way, his name's Jeff Grant. He, okay. he has a website called Hillseeker. And, uh, and you've got to get in there and say, yes, rain. And get that sort of wired into your body that when adversity comes, you're going to welcome it. So yeah. I've applied this with my children, for example. What I tell my children, and they, they laugh about it, I say, hey, if you succeeded, go tell your mother. I'm, I, you know, I'll find out soon enough. And yeah, I'll celebrate with you, no problem. But if you fail, then you need to call me up right away because then I really want to celebrate with you because it's 
it's the number of failures that you get in life that are really going to determine your success. So yeah. not unhappy about your successes, but I really want to be there with you when you fail because I really want you to feel good about yourself and we're going to feel great about the fact that you failed. And um, uh, and that's a kind of an application of this kind of neuroassociative conditioning into kind of the micromanagement of our daily moods. And while we're at it, you know, let's just let's just be clear. All of this stuff, we can we can multiply by ten the impacts that it has on us when it's when we're investing. So, you know, I can guarantee. You know, we're now uh, in case this goes out sometime at a later date. And I did happen to check the Tesla stock price today, and I think it was pretty close to 900. It's okay. not at a peak, but I I feel like almost certain that a very significant number of not just the listeners to this podcast, but people in the United States, people on the planet, are thinking, "Why the hell did I idiot not invest in Tesla?" And um, you know, if you see that in the same context as the rain comes in, you say, "Oh, why did I go running in the rain?" It's the same thing, and you have to get in there and say. You know, whatever it is that you've trained yourself to say to help you, to help me to feel good about myself, in spite of the fact that I did not uh, buy Tesla or Amazon or Netflix when it, well, they were all one dollar a share. Because I'll tell you something uh, that really amazes me is that when I see how what puts some people out of the investment business. So you know, if you, if we know that to invest well. To be successful in investing, you need to stay in the game for a very, very long time. The right. longer you stay in the game, the better it's going to get. Then the key thing is not what your returns are today, tomorrow, this week, next week. The key is, how do I stay in the game? And that means that you need to manage and preserve your resources. And I've seen people who leave the game of investing because they stress themselves out over whether they bought Amazon or Netflix or uh, Tesla, or they got the wrong investors who stressed them out, or they went and got themselves a short position in Tesla, which yeah. stressed them out and burnt them out. And and so um, I'd be stressed too with this Tesla position right now. If I so, if I was short. So you know, um, yeah. getting in there with the right. So so that's more than just. So there's only like, you know, if the rain comes. Yeah. Train yourself with a yes rain. All right. But, you know, don't consciously go and put yourself out in the rain because it's probably not going to bode well for uh, a long-term career in running. So try and go running when it's not raining or get the right clothing. Uh, but the realization that um, as we are picking our investments, as we pick the, peop- the investors that we want to associate with, people who invest big, in my That fund, is a big deal that sometimes goes um, underappreciated as picking the right investors as well, not just them picking you. So, you know, we are constantly constructing our environment, both the internal mental environment that, by the way, Eric, congratulations, because I don't, it takes a certain kind of humility to get to the place that I now realize that you're in, where you understand, hey, wait a second, I've got to go back on myself. I've got to go and re-examine things that I've been doing, and I've got to fundamentally redo a whole bunch of stuff that I'm doing. So that's kind of internal reorganization and right you make a very good the very, a very good point about that having to be not just a cosmetic rearranging of the furniture it's kind of a reconstruction of ourselves but then it's also you know where where is my office who are my friends uh, uh who are my enemies do i have any enemies what am i engaged with every day what is shouting at me on a daily basis and that's going to really really affect our lives and if we can start having that self-awareness then we can start constructing those environments day by day bit by bit and small but permanent shifts are just so unbelievably powerful over a long period of time yeah well you know i think they intertwine so you know one of my experiences when um, the guy, the guy who, one of the the guy who trained me, he's a former, I'm not going to say his name, but he's a former vice president of uh, Disney and he now, you know, quit and does this full time and travels around the world. And, you know, there's a lot of conversations around integrity and, and also a lot of conversations around authenticity. And one of the things that I saw is that my access to authenticity is noticing where I'm being inauthentic. And always looking to see my own inauthenticities. 
and also looking to see where I'm out of integrity with myself, what I said I would do, acknowledge the impact. There's all, there's a whole world which I don't have time in this uh, podcast for. But what's interesting as those things start becoming uncovered, yes, it, it alters the way that I occur for myself and the way that I actually experience self, like myself, like who am I? But then I start noticing it's like it would almost be like you're living in a house and things start getting reorganized internally. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, my God, there's all these marks on the wall that I need to clean up now. And <laughs> and it becomes, you know, when people say, well, if I do this training, am I going to have less problems? I go, no, you're going to have a lot more problems, but you're also going to be empowered to clean them up. And That's amazing. Yeah. So it really it really goes uh, hand in hand. If you don't have any problems, you're not probably looking deep enough. <laughs> Yeah, but that that sounds amazing. I, I'd be interested to meet this former Disney exec. And so I I recently had a I, I, actually, at some point I'll, I'll I'll introduce you to some pretty extraordinary people in this world. I'd, I think it'll really blow your mind, and I I'd, think you'll learn a lot. And, yeah, and vice versa. absolutely. I would love I'd love to learn that's, from them and meet them. You know, guy, I think that's another thing, and uh, you know, just get really personal for a second. But you know, I've known you since I'm I think seventeen or eighteen years old. I'm thirty two now. Yeah. And something that I feel we have always connected on, like I remember one of the first time I, I met you and we were at, uh, you remember Kolbe in New York City? Oh, yeah, right, absolutely. And I remember Shai Dardashti. Yeah, yeah. If Shai is listening, hi, hi Shai. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we were sitting down and uh, you had said something. I, maybe there was a mistake in the order. I don't remember exactly what happened. You said to me, and you were like, um, I hope I wasn't like too rude to that waitress. I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're totally fine. It, it wasn't, I don't think she took it personally at all. And there was always this concern for other people, but there was always this interest in other people. And I've always just loved, like, I love human beings and really interesting. I've never been a surface guy and I've always really been interested in just learning about people and really learning about their world. So I'm the, I've always been somewhere where like if someone's like, hey, Eric, I think you'd really love getting to know blah, blah, blah. I, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever said no in my life because people who know me, I do kind of just trust them. If they're going to connect me to someone, there's probably a really good reason, even if I don't know the reason. And they don't even have to tell me the reason. But as I discover that, it's like, oh, wow, thank you so much. I, I've never been non-grateful in hindsight for, for an introduction. So I, I've always been that kind of guy where if you want to introduce me to someone... I'm just an automatic yes. And, you know, you, you, so it's like, yeah, I can just literally say on the show, hey, I'd love to connect you to blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, sure. It's, it's, I, I can relate so much to that. Well, you, I think you have to be careful. So, so one thought that comes up is, um, uh, and I think it's from a, from a Jewish text called Pirkei Avot, saying of the sayings of the fathers, which is that who is wise, he who learns from every man. So, you know, every conversation you have is an opportunity to learn even if the person you're speaking to isn't thinking. But I, I would bring something else into this. Sure, please. Which is, um, if you do, if you create goodwill around people for long enough, an inevitable condition of success that you live in is that there are more people who want to access my time than I have hours in the day for. And that's been a hard thing for me that I still don't probably fully haven't learned is that you do have to say no. Oh, and, yep. And so, but but there's an interesting, you know... There, well, the there, keyword was just, the people that really know me well, which also right. know that they're going to have respect for my time. And there's then a whole level of knowledge that I think that goes into structuring the network around one mm -hmm. when you can actually pick and choose who is your friend, who is somebody that you want to interact with, and what kind of, like, what kind of notes do they play? If, ever, if the people around you are notes on a piano, what is their... What is the note that they play? Is it a note that you want in your life, a note that you don't want in your life? And I tell you, so this goes away from uh, sort of self-help, psychology, self-management, and sure. into um, something uh, extraordinarily practical. Uh, I used to uh, make introductions pretty much without asking the person. So, if, you know, I'm in a conversation with a friend or person that I know, A, who says, oh, would you and I offered to introduce them to person B? I would make the judgment call whether or not to do that, and then I just make the introduction. No longer so, and I think this is I a powerful insight. I think that's very smart. So now I figured out that 
even if I think it's a great idea for person A to meet person B, and even if person A thinks it's a good idea, person B might not like it. Right. And I need to respect person B's space and time, and I need to have, build my reputation with person B. So now I will tell person A, <clears throat> great, let me first check in with person B, and if they're interested to get to know you, I'll get back to you. Then I check in with person B, tell them, and see what they say before it. So there has to be a double positive on both yeah, sides. Yeah, and, and, and I'll even add to that 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 <clears throat> I mean, that's interesting you say because it is a practice. It's one of those things where now that you're saying it, okay, I, it's a practice I do, but I don't even think of it as a practice. But one one of the things that is impactful about that is that even if those two people were interested in meeting each other, and even if those two people would really hit it off. The very fact that you gave them the opportunity to say yes to you and just to say, yeah, I would like to do that, it creates a, it, there is a level of, I get, you know, as you said, some, some space. It's like, wow, like, I really feel respected. I, I have that space to be and I chose it versus it just kind of coming at me. Yeah. And so I, and I think that with anything in life, really, I mean, I, there, there are times where, you know, for instance, like, I'm, pretty easy to coach if you know someone's to give me some coaching or someone sees a, a blind spot with me it, it's i'm not the hardest person to work with but people know to say hey can i offer you something can i can i offer you an insight can can i have you maybe see something another way and the very fact that they ask me even though they be pretty sure yeah. i'm gonna say yes the fact that they yeah. ask me it gives me some space to be in the conversation. Otherwise I'll feel a little suffocated. Like, well, well I didn't ask for this or, right now. Yeah. Or defensive. Def and it allows yeah. you to structure it and say, well, not right now, maybe next week I'm feeling, you know, I'm either busy or I've actually, you know, the person, the love of my life has just told me to get out of their lives. And so I, it's just not the right time to receive constructive feedback, for example. Yeah. But I'll tell you, yeah. I'll tell you a short story. Yeah, please. Uh, by, so I think it's, uh, a professor at Harvard Business School called Erwin Kotler, who wrote a book about the founder of Panasonic, whose surname is Matsushita. And I don't remember. His, I think it's maybe Akio Matsus Matsushita. I, I'm feeling the urge because we're on a Skype conversation to go and look it up on the Internet. But I'm going to resist the urge because the stories, your listeners, the listeners can look this up. Okay. Uh, but... Um, so Matsushita was, uh, he founded one of the most successful electronics companies in Japan, and he was an elderly and very rich and powerful man who was also sick, and he had gone with some of his colleagues to eat at a restaurant uh, somewhere in Japan, and because of his illness, he couldn't eat the food, and um, he asked for the chef, mm -hmm. and this kind of like a murmur across the staff in the restaurant. Why is this man asking for the chef? What's wrong with the restaurant? What's wrong with the food? What happened? And the chef comes out and he says to the chef, you know, Mr. Chef, I, I, I needed to tell you this personally. I think your food is great and your restaurant is great. And I need you to know personally that I cannot eat it, eat the food because I am sick and uh, it's not because I don't like the food and I can't see what a great job you guys are doing. Uh, and he said, I have to tell you this personally, because if I was to pass the message, you might not believe it. And you might think that I was just passing you off. So I want you to know that. That is a guy who understands well, enormous amounts of empathy for the other yeah. side and enormous understanding, human wisdom of understanding how messages get communicated. And uh, it's just, just always something, oh, a window closed. It always stood out for me. And it's funny that you've I, you told a kind of a similar story in uh, maybe that happened in Colbert, but I would tell you that my choice of, I feel very lucky in my choice of spouse or in the spouse that chose me, my wife never lets me forget uh, uh, how important those human interactions are and how important it is to make sure that people around you feel good about the fact that you're there. And funnily enough, I actually think it's at the root of perhaps all success. You know, one of the things I think is so under quoted from Charlie Munger, there are so many things that are quoted by Charlie Munger is, it's such a simple phrase, but it's got 
all the wisdom one needs really is the best way to get success is to deserve it yeah you know you want to live your life in such a way that when eventually god willing you get success people are going to look at you and say wow that guy really deserves that success because that's genuine success and um it's funny people ask me either do i want to grow aquamarine fund or how big do i want to grow and i say yeah i'd like to grow and yeah it'd be nice if it was big but one condition i don't I, you know, I, I want to have friends. I don't want this thing to be successful if I lose friends and if I have to behave in a way that would lose me friends and relationships. I was and, just going to uh, say, if you can still be this, if you can you know, wake up in the morning and be proud of who you are. Yeah. And the, uh, look, again, it just goes down to try and give a little more than you take or give a lot more than you take. And if you can, if we had everybody, actually, I've started a new rule for myself. And I realized it. So, Eric, did, you, did you ever read "Give and Take" by Adam Grant? By any chance? Yeah, it's a fantastic yeah, book. He, yeah. I, I was writing my book when that book came out, and as I read Adam Grant's book, I realized that I had to like delete a chapter in my book because huh. um, uh, because I had something along the same lines, and I was like, okay, Adam Grant's got this covered. It's just one line right. that the reader that says, "Go read Adam Grant's book," and I'm so blown away by how many people. Uh, don't read it because it's just a, yeah, it's a really, really powerful book, yeah. valuable book. Um, yeah, I had another thought, but it disappeared. I'm sorry. That's Slipped okay. down the drain. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, uh, I think that many people are disappointed with my book because they expect to, they pick it up expecting to learn a lot more about investing and what they learn really about is, first of all, my life experience, but it's all around the kind of stuff that we've been talking about, which I think is way more important and way more profound than anything that I might be able to teach the reader about investing and probably way, way more important and profound than anything that anybody else, even the greatest teachers of investing, could teach the reader. And um, those are the real tools that, that we'll get. Because in a certain way, it goes beyond investing. If you're lucky enough to live in a country where you can com- accumulate capital, then the investing tools are good. But I feel like the tools that I'm talking about are ones that you can use even countries where it might be impossible to accumulate capital, like Russia, you know, or communist Russia, let's say. These are tools that would would have worked in communist Russia, if you yeah. like. Well, there's a narrative around, you can call them tools, or what, you know, there's there's a narrative around it this idea of them being quote unquote soft skills. And there, there seems to be this myth. Um, I, we actually, I, I went into this a little bit on a, another one of the episodes when I did it with, um, Scott Forgey, who does, um, he does work for PayPal and Google and he literally helped build the culture of Lululemon when it was Chip Wilson and his wife and, and his coach. And that was it. Um, but we talk about this a lot that people have this, almost notion that if you can't measure it or fit it nicely in a spreadsheet, it's almost like it doesn't exist, which of course is literally ridiculous. Cause for you, for you to say that, you know, a loving relationship is not an important to the quality of your life would be insane. I don't know exactly how you put that into a nice algorithm and a spreadsheet, but I can also know what's really important. So I think part of it is a function of our culture that they look at, you know, some of the things that we're talking about, and it's like, well, I don't like it's not measurable enough. The other thing, too, is that if you haven't experienced, it's kind of like when I said, you know, what's the difference between what you're talking about and positive thinking? The chances that someone heard that and now it, it radically changed their life, may, maybe, but it may just still land as something intellectual. And if it still is intellectual, you might get it in like if you get something intellectually in this realm, it doesn't mean it really got in with you. No. And you know, you can read a lot of self help books and know a lot more stuff without having an impact the quality of your life. On the flip side, you can have things impact the quality of your life and not really know how or why it worked. I, I'm I have a quirk and then I, I find it interesting how it works, but it's yeah. not actually necessary. Um, no. And for an analytical person like me, that's sometimes hard to say. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that um, where was I going with this? That 
be these skills really have to a lot of them it, it's wisdom based and it, and it has to be got in some way you know ex- experientially and internally yeah. and, you know whatever path there is you know is, so is i'll tell path. you yeah again this is nowhere near investing but yeah so because of various experiences i decided i had to go and do a vipassana meditation retreat mm-hmm which uh, I went and did a couple of years ago, no, not a couple of years ago, about six months ago. And, um, uh, you know, I learned that meditation is not what I thought it was. So first of all, I left the retreat. The retreat was a 10-day retreat. I left it after three nights. What did you think it was? I mean, I've certainly done one-hour meditation classes. I've done Mm -hmm. plenty of yoga. Uh, But, um, you know, one important truth about life is that doesn't matter how successful you are, there is always suffering. That is just part of the human condition. You know, I feel extraordinarily fortunate um, to live in the home that we have as a family. And because our children are at school in the UK, we now have another home in the UK. And you'd think that that's incredible. Two homes, isn't that wonderful? It's kind of sad, really. I'm in one home, my wife's in another home, and and it makes me happy to be with my wife. But yeah. it's just not working out right now. Suffering is um, just a part of the human condition, and that's something that I think that I I didn't expect meditation to be about suffering. Okay. But in a certain way, part of what I learned in meditation is that it's about, you know, so there's there's you know, in the same way with the rain. If you like, it's like, oh, my God, it's raining. This is so terrible. Right. I want to go home. It's like, no, yes, rain. This is great. It's raining. Let's keep running. Uh, you know, oh, hello, suffering. Oh, so we're suffering. That's cool. Let's keep going. Right. You know? There's a great uh, – I tweeted it out recently. I watched a film, Jojo Rabbit. There's a great quote at the end of the film, which, okay, Eric, I'm now going to look it up because uh, – That's okay. Uh, I'm actually, I'm actually going to go to my Twitter profile and just see what I tweeted out. But it's so wonderful. Um, uh, oh God, why is it not there? You may have to. You may have to edit this piece. Uh, uh, we can always add it to the show notes too, if you want to find yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. It over uh, let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. And uh, isn't that just beautiful? I love I that. I just love yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> I really love that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so, guy, I think um, we should wrap it up. But you know, before we go, is there any other things you think I should ask you, or things you would like to share before we finish up? Yeah. So, Eric, you know, um, uh, I think that often people think of value investors, and they want to think of investing. Uh, that means buying shares in the stock market or maybe buying private equity and investing in companies, financial balance sheet, uh, things of that nature. And I think that part of my journey has been to realize that there's something much more profound than that, which is, you know, the financial side of my balance sheet, uh, I, I was going to say may well be, but actually without a doubt is the least important part of my balance sheet you ask how can i say that well here are some things which are far far more important my physical health am i healthy and fit and is my physical experience of my body and my world and my life in in the most immediate sensory uh meaning what is that like because without that we have nothing no amount of money is going to save us from a heart attack uh or from any one of the other terrible things that happen so you know, our, our physical health, the, my mental health, my um, relationship with uh, my wife, my loved ones, my friends, my investors, broader community. So um, we tend to focus on the financial side of our balance sheets. But most humans neglect, not all, but I would say the majority neglect these other aspects of our balance sheets. And I think that one of the I started following Warren Buffett and going to the Berkshire meetings and trying to follow and listen to Charlie Munger. And I thought that what I was going to learn was how to get rich. But what I really learned was that there was all this investment that I had to make in those other aspects of my balance sheet. And, um, uh, you know, this famous idea of it's not 
it's not how rich you are. You know, X, Y, Z rich person died. How did you know how much money he left? And the answer is all of it. And um, how many people came to your funeral? How many people care about you? And I think that what we've been talking about, and it's a subject for endless study, is what are the practical steps that we can take to invest in those other non-tangible, non-financially tangible aspects of our balance sheets? If we can get that stuff going, then the financial side will almost take care of itself. And so I would argue that I'm a I'm also a value investor in stocks and shares, but I'm also a value investor in human relationships. I'm a value investor in myself. I'm a value investor in habits, habits of mind, habits of body. And that is neglected and is actually far more valuable and important. It's the infrastructure around which we can build a successful financial life. If our mental health and physical health and our relationships are not there, who cares how rich we are? If we have too many enemies in the world, it's not a happy life. And um, and so in a certain way, this is about investing, but it's about the profound infrastructure of investing rather than the kind of the surface of whether Tesla is overvalued or undervalued. And I think that that's what I, if I think I have something valuable to share with, with the listenership of this podcast, it's that insight. I love that. And, you know, that was a big reason that I wanted you on today is to share more about uh, sometimes the things that are hard to put into words, you know, it's like a good poem um, or a good song. The things that move you or really inspire you about the poem or the song, if I said, well, explain the thing that inspired you, you might not be able to say it. And I think there's an art to being able to um, share and share about the unsayable. Yeah. So thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And thank, thank you uh, for coming on and uh, hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add.